Our scripture reading today comes from John, book of John, chapter 17. And I will be reading from the English Standard Version. John, chapter 17. When Jesus, Jesus had spoken the words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Now I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You have sent, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous, o righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I make known to them in your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The title of our seminar this time was to know God, to know self, know man, and to know Jesus Christ. And we have just heard from John chapter 17, the very prayer that Jesus prayed the night before he was crucified. And he prayed first of all for himself, he prayed for the disciples, and he prayed for all believers, not just for them, the disciples that were with him, but he prayed for us, those who would live even the 21st century now, looking back into the past. And it is our prayer that this prayer that Jesus prayed would be true of all of us as we come to know Him. 
The memory verse for today, verse 3, says this, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If you were asked the question, what is the most important thing in your life, what would you say? I'm not talking about your worldly career success or your life or happiness, your marriage, your family. I'm talking about that concerns you eternally. And we have the word eternal life here. What, what does that mean? And what do they mean when they say eternal life? You know, if you go to church or if you read the Bible, you come across these terms so often. And you kind of brush them off as something spiritual. That's what the Bible says. Eternal life, okay, well, whatever that is. And to believe in God, to be a child of God, to be a Christian. We use these terms without thinking too much about these things. But what do they actually mean? We know what life means. We are all alive and we have life to live. And what is eternal life? Our life that we live now is not eternal, as we have seen yesterday. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if due to the reason of strength, we might live longer, 80, 90, maybe 100 years. But all we have to boast is our labor and sorrow, and we fly away, and it is soon cut of Psalm 90, verse 10. David wrote this Psalm 3,000 years ago, that our life is very temporal. Eternal life is obviously to live eternally. So what does that mean? Surely it cannot mean something like you know, living like a zombie, you know, without the body that can sustain that life forever. Eternal life is to live eternally, not just in terms of duration. It talks more about the quality of life. Not only that, it, it talks about life that is without any reference to time. That's what eternity is. Eternity is not just a long time. Eternity is without any sense of time. It's almost as if the time stopped now. And that is eternity. And it's hard to imagine that for you know, us human beings who are living in the three-dimensional world with limited sort of uh, in terms of time and space, we cannot really comprehend what eternity would be like. All we can do is to go back to the Bible and read from the scripture. God is eternal, and that means God is perfect, unchanging, He is everywhere in, in all places, and He also knows all things from all time because God is eternal. When God is perfect, it also means that He doesn't change, and that means He is eternal. He's not like this now and like that the next moment, but he's saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Eternal life is to be in that eternal world where God is. And of course, and as Christians, we might say that I have eternal life. It doesn't mean that you live in your current state eternally, because that's not possible with our physical body. But when our life in this world comes to an end, then we translate into the eternal world and enjoy that eternal life. Another way to say that is eternal life is to live eternally in heaven. Heaven is eternal. But also, eternal, um, in the eternal world, there is eternal hell. So on, on the one hand, you can say that everybody lives eternally. It is only that some go to heaven and live eternally with God. And that is what we commonly refer to as eternal life. But others who do not believe in God, others who do not trust in God, others who are not saved, will spend their eternity in eternal hell. Hell is also eternal as we read from the scriptures. So when you talk about eternal life, it is not simply to live eternally. It is to live in heaven with God eternally. The Bible says those who are going to eternal hell perish or are destroyed or suffer in eternal hell with eternal punishment. So then how do you get this eternal life? How do you have that eternal life? Is there some sort of arbitrary thing that I can claim that I have eternal life and then that's how it is? Or is this something mystic or is it something that um, we can see tangibly? How do I know that I have eternal life and how do we know that anyone has eternal life? Now going back to Jesus' prayer in verse 3, it says, This is eternal life that you may know you that is the only true God and to know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. First you have to know God and then you have to know Jesus Christ whom God has sent. And that's why we looked at yesterday, knowledge of God, knowing God. How then do we know God? How can we know God? 
Let's now think about knowledge or knowing for a little time. There have been few books written on that subject, Knowledge of God or Knowing God, and one of those books is written by J.F. Pekka, and he discusses that in his book, What is Knowledge? What is Knowing? When it comes to something that is inanimate, for example, um, this table, chair, you can kind of look at it and sit on it, and that is sturdy enough to support your weight, and you know that chair. I know that this chair is good enough for me to sit on. And if you know that the chair is broken, you're not going to sit on because it might not support your weight. When it comes to um, creatures like animals, you can kind of know your creature. If you spend maybe a few days with your dog, with your cat, with your horse, um, then you get to know that animal well enough to know whether that animal is um, going to behave or not. When you come to knowledge, when it comes to knowledge, you can see that it actually is based on your knowledge and the history. If it's a simple thing, it takes a short, short time. If it's a bit more complicated, like this computer, or maybe some you know, smart watch, smartphone, it takes a few days to get used to all the features that are available. But you know that once you know, you know it, because it works as expected. When it comes to living things, it might take a little longer, and it might take a little bit more observation. You observe the behavior, and it can, you can actually know that, that animal. There's always that little bit of unexpected element as well, and that's why it takes a little longer And you look at uh, not only the history, but also the behavior and the pattern and the way that the creature thinks and so on. But he actually discusses, J.F. Packer discusses, said uh, that um, knowing um, a human being is a bit more complicated than that. Would you agree? How do you know that you know someone? This is not simply a knowledge or information about that person. It is not about just reading a biography of a person, but how do you know anyone personally? How can I say that I know so and so? You have to have some sort of experience in history. You have to have known that person for some time. That person might have to know you as well. Not only that, you have to have, you have, to have spent enough time um, interacting with that person. And then you can say that I now know my, you know, my wife, my husband, my family, my friends. Um, I think I know the person, but I am not sure if I know how he would react, how she would react. That means you've got some limited knowledge of the person. And, and let, let me ask this question. Why is that? Why is it different when it comes to human beings? Why is it different when you come to someone you know, who um, has you know, even more intelligence than animals. The author actually says something very interesting. It's because of secret. Animals don't have secrets. They just behave according to instincts. But human beings have secrets. And they don't always tell you that. They always have something that is in their heart that they do not always disclose to other people. And that's why you just do not know that person completely. And you see these people who live with their spouse for 20, 30 years, and then after that they come to the marriage crisis and say, well, I, I thought I knew my wife, but I guess I didn't. Vice versa. You know, I thought I knew my husband, but I guess I didn't. They had some secret that they were hiding. They might go through some separation and divorce. And they thought they knew each other, but they did not know each other because they were hiding things. So it becomes a little complicated. But then again, what about knowledge of God? How can you say that we know God? And this, by the way, is not just information. To know God is to know Him personally. And let's move that a little further. It's like eternal life. Eternal life actually means to know eternally, but to know eternal life and to know God so that you are in heaven. And we talked about that. You can also have eternal, um, you know, kind, kind of eternal life in hell as well. But to know God, and to have that knowledge of God is to have that relationship with God that you can go to heaven, you have eternal life. On the other hand, you might know God as the judge. And the Bible says even demons know God and they believe in God and they tremble because they know God and they believe in God's existence and that God is holy, but they are the subjects of eternal hell and God's damnation. So when it comes to God, how can we say that you know God? Well, you can 
come to the answer quite logically and quite simply. You have to have some knowledge of God. You cannot simply claim and say, I know God, even though you don't know about God. You have to have some knowledge of God and God's history, what God has been like, at least in the past history. And at the same time, you can read from God's word and know about God's will and his intention and his plan. Things that have not taken place yet, but we know that God is faithful and therefore God will do it. Well, one thing that simplifies the matter compared to knowing a person is that God never lies. So you can trust him. So it may not take that long a time to get to know God, actually. You might spend 20, 30 years of your lifetime trying to get to know a person and may not know the person, but you can spend some time studying the scripture and learn about God's history and what God said and what God will do and actually know him and even trust him because we know that one of God's attributes that he cannot break is that he cannot lie. He tells the truth all the time. The knowledge of God is proportional to how much God reveals himself to us. The knowledge of God that you can have is proportional to how much God reveals himself to us. So the question then would be, so how much does God reveal himself to us? How much do you think God reveals about himself to us? Through the scripture. Well, we can say he reveals to us about himself as much as we can know. There are some things that we will just not be able to know because we are limited in our knowledge. And yet God reveals himself about himself to us. Some things that we can comprehend, but some things that we sometimes struggle to comprehend. For example, um, there is the, the doctrine of Trinity in the Bible. The word Trinity may not appear in the Bible, but the Bible teaches that God is one, and yet he is in three distinct persons. The God the Father, the Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now how can one be three or three one? We might ask the question. And really, throughout the history for millennia, even Bible scholars, most knowledgeable and learned scholars have grappled with the question but couldn't really come up with a clear answer. They still say, yes, God is one, but he is in three distinct persons. Does it make sense in our human brain? But yet, that's what the Bible says. We also learn that God is sovereign in the Bible. In other words, he is in control of all things for all time, even into the future, uh, surpassing and, 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 um, and, and transcending the time and all the contingencies of life. We can only um, see things as happen. And we can make plans and we can try to um, execute those plans, but sometimes those do not happen. And you know, we might have to change um, things and, and make mid-course corrections and so on. But not so with God. God's plan always comes true. And if anything changes, that even was in God's plan originally. And that's why the Bible says things like, God planned our salvation from before time began, before the foundation of the world. And it took place exactly as God had planned. So when it comes to sovereignty of God, we cannot understand everything, and yet we know that he is sovereign. So there are some things that we, we struggle to understand, and yet we are given these truths from the Bible. He reveals himself to us that much. And of course, there are things that we can know about God, that God has um, worked in his creation. He has also led the Israelites throughout their history according to his will. And also, um, he prophesied about the birth of Jesus Christ when he was born. 2,000 years ago, and he actually did what God had planned for our salvation. They are all written in the Bible. So you go to the scripture and learn about God. Learn about what God has said, what God has done, and we can know him. And you can trust him because he's always faithful, he's always true. That's um, somewhat ironical, isn't it? Um, when it comes to human beings, it's hard to know a person, someone else, and yet it is somewhat more straightforward to know God. It's obviously because of sin, sin that entangles man, that we have 
this tendency to deceive each other, to hide certain things, and that's why it's hard and struggle to know each other, and our relationship is actually affected by that sin. But of course, we know that God has no sin. He is holy, pure, and perfect. And therefore, the knowledge, the pure knowledge of God that you derive out of the scripture, you understand from the, the Bible, the very word of God, is something you can trust with your life and trust in God. And that's how much you can know about God. So Jesus said, it begins there. You have to know God, who is eternal. We learned yesterday um, that David wrote many psalms, and he actually wrote these psalms um, to express his emotions. He was speaking to God. It's almost like prayer language. He's praying to God. He's speaking to God. But as he does that, he also reveals certain truths about God, that God is sovereign, that God is the creator. We saw that as, as well yesterday. And then all these creations declare God's work. They all cry out that God has created them. And as we look at that, even though Psalms are written in poetic form, in po as poems, these Psalms actually still tell the truth. So you cannot just discount them as some poems. Um, there are truths that are buried in these Psalms. So we looked at that, that God is the creator. And also, we saw the fact that God is holy, and his word is holy, and righteous, and just, and faithful. All these characteristics or attributes of God are written in Psalms. So we know him. We know him as much as we have learned yesterday. And then Jesus says here, eternal life is no God. The only true God, there's only one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus Christ whom God has sent. Now, remember that this is Jesus praying to God, so he's speaking to God, so you, especially with capital Y, refers to God. I want these people, my disciples and future believers, I want them to know God and to know Christ and therefore have eternal life. This is what Jesus is praying for. And as I said that uh, before, um, I pray that this prayer of Jesus will be true of us, that we will know God and Christ. Look at a few of the words that Jesus said here in chapter 17. Verse 9, he says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but pray for those whom you have given me they are yours, the disciples. But not only that, he says later, I do not pray only for them, but I pray for all those who would believe in me. Go to the, the last part of chapter 17. Let me read verse 25 and 26. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you. The world refers to people who do not believe. But I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. And this is all the prayer that Jesus prays for all believers, so that they would believe and have eternal life. When you know a person and say that I know him or I know, I know her, it also implies that the other person knows you as well. If you read a book about a certain person, you can say I know about that person because I've read a book about the person's life, but that person may not know you. In other words, you know him or her, but you are not known by that person. The knowledge of God for salvation, knowledge of God for eternal life actually means that you know God and you're known by God. So the, re the, the real question, um, the first question is, do you know God? The second question, which is more important, is, does God know you? Does God know you? Now you might think that that's a little illogical because we say that God is omniscient. He knows all things, all people, whether you go to heaven or hell, of course, surely God would know everybody. So when we say, when God knows you, I mean knowing you savingly. 
knowing you because you are saved, knowing you because you're going to heaven, knowing you because you have eternal life, knowing you because you're his child. God knows even those who are going to hell. He knows all. He has perfect knowledge. But that's a different kind of knowledge. That's a different kind of relationship. Everybody has a relationship with God. You know, e either God is your savior or God is your judge. So when we say, or when Jesus said, I want them to know you for eternal life, that knowledge of God is to know God saving me. That you know him, you're known by him as his child. And that's why in Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, for example, Paul said, you know God and rather you're known by God. You not only have knowledge of God, but God knows you and that's important because that's how you know you're saved. And that's why um, we looked at yesterday knowing God and knowing man. Knowing man, we actually um, saw many of the Psalms in the Bible that talked about um, David and, and our sinful nature. You can put a bookmark here in John chapter 17. Um, we, we'll, we'll come back to the scripture later, but let's go back towards Psalms. Turn back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Let me read from verse 1. Now this is David's prayer. And he's really troubled with his sin. He says here, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. You can see his lament. He's crying out for God's loving kindness, his mercies, his forgiveness, because he has this sin. Now, let me give you a little bit of context about this. Now, David, he was the king in Israel 3,000 years ago. But because he was king, he was able to do all things. He was faithful and he was a good man for the most part. But he, he did some sinful things every now and then, and this was particularly sinful before God because he actually took someone's wife, his general's wife, and he actually caused his general to be killed in the battlefield intentionally. So he committed essentially adultery, and in order to hide adultery, he killed indirectly the husband who was faithful to him, loyal to him. So he committed adultery and murder, and he's trying to sort of cover that up and just brush that off as something that king, you know, would do with his power. He, he now, in fact, um, he not only tries to cover that up, he tries to actually present himself as a, a generous person by taking this widow, now widow whose husband has just died in the battlefield, as his own wife. And he's trying to sort of beautify his own sin. But that gets uncovered. A prophet, um, God spoke to prophet Nathan, and Nathan comes to David and says, you have done this, this, this terrible sin before God. He uses some story to tell David, and then David realizes that it was him, and he has committed sin before God and before people. And once he realizes that he has done this terrible thing, even though he was king, he didn't try to um, sort of... Um, um, exercise his power and authority to cover that up and to uh, you know, sort of acquit him from his, his guilt, he actually becomes very repentant. Uh, he comes to God with full broken heart and says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In other words, he's saying, yes, I have done this terrible thing, but would you be able to not judge me according to my sins? Instead, would you 
blot out my transgressions. Can you somehow forgive my sins and erase my sins and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin? Because I acknowledge my sin to you. I, I repent my sin. My sin is always before me. It is always troubling me, but it is only you against, against whom I have sinned, and it is only you who can forgive my sins. Now, we, we can actually see some very um, insightful theology, here, theological truth here. First of all, when you sin, your conscience accuses you for that sin, and you should not ignore that. Instead, you, need to, you ought to go to God and ask for forgiveness. Secondly, when you sin and realize that you've sinned, I guess whether you realize it or not, when you sin against a person, it is not only sinning against that person, but it is always sinning against God. When you commit a sin, it is in breach of God's law, and therefore it offends God. It may offend people, but it offends God. And you sin against God. It's like you might commit a murder, but the victim or victim family might say, it's okay, we forgive you, you know, all, all is well. Just because they forgive you doesn't mean that you can go free. You've actually broken the law of the country, and you need to be judged according to the law of the country, and the court might send you to a prison, or maybe even sentence you to death, or you know, whatever the, the punishment is due. You have to sinned against the law of that country, the state law. Likewise, whenever you sin, you sin against God and against people. And David realized that. My sin is always before me and against you, and you only have I sinned. And this, done, uh, this evil I have done in your sight. And thirdly, the important truth that he realized was in verse 5, that he found out that he was bored. He was born in sin. I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. This is a really profound truth. To realize that he, and us, in fact, the soul, are born sinful from birth. From the moment of conception, we are born with what we call sinful nature. We have tendency and potential to sin from birth. And that's why also we read from Psalm 58, it says, even from the moment, moment we are born, we are born speaking lies, we go astray from God. When the Bible says sinner, evil people, wicked people, it's not some terrible people in that you know, prison or jail, it's referring to every single person, including you and I. We are the wicked, and we are the evil, and we are the sinful people, because we are born with sin. We are born with problem from the beginning. And once you understand that, you realize why um, sometimes trying to reform people of their behaviors will, you know, doesn't work. It will not work, because it is simply trying to modify their behaviors, and it doesn't really change the person's heart. That's God's work when you realize that you've got all this underlying sinful nature and tendency to sin in your life, you realize why you sometimes lie, you realize why you are rebellious, you realize why you are so stubborn, you realize that why you do the things that you know it is wrong, but you sometimes even enjoy and take pleasure in doing that. You realize even why kids do not listen to you, you realize why they do the naughty things and, and sometimes you know, they continue to do that even though you try to correct them. And you realize why sometimes some educated and cultured people in their sort of mature age go and do something terribly criminal and sinful using their intelligence. The clever people do sinful things in more clever ways, and they think they get away with it. Of course, they might do that in this world, but never so from God's court. God knows all things, and in fact, the Bible says, your mouth will confess all your sins before God. God doesn't need any attorney or accusing lawyer he doesn't need a prosecutor. He is the prosecutor himself. And he actually will enlist your own conscience to accuse you of your guilt and your sin. It's because of this sin that is ingrained in our human nature. 
And that's what David realized. In sin, my mother conceived me. In a sense, if we unleash ourselves according to our sinful nature, if there is no restraint, then all we do would be sinning. All we would say are sinful things. All we would do are sinful behaviors. And we see some of that in some people's lives. I hope not here, but you can, I'm sure you can think of someone who would swear at every sentence that they speak. In everything that they do, they display some form of rebellion, some form of hatred, some form of resentment and bitterness in everything that they say, in everything that they do on a daily basis. And that's what happens if you remove that restraint. It is only that we have the law in this world and social code, customs, that we you know, don't behave in that way. But if you actually take away all that restraint, and if you can actually see basically uh, bare sinful human beings without any of these laws or regulations or even social customs, you, you have basically uh, a world that is like hell. But I guess um, you know, in some people's imagination, they can imagine that and write into stories and novels and make into movies and so on. And you have this lawless country, lawless places where people just go and do whatever they want. Now we actually had those, that sort of country and that sort of world uh, in, in the past. If you look at the Bible in the time of Genesis ch chapter 6, before the flood, the world was basically a lawless society. There was no law. People were living according to what they wanted to do. If you go to even the time of um, Babel, people were building the Tower of Babel, challenging God's authority. There was no law from God. And all they did was to challenge God and say that, you know, let's make our name great. You look at the history of Israel, and they often really ran into that problem when they disregarded God's law. During the time of Judges, toward the end, they said, let's just do whatever we, we think is right. They did not ask God for guidance, but they were doing things according to what they saw fit, according to their own sinful nature. That's what you see. We need to actually go under that surface and see what's in our hearts. And the Bible tells us, that because our heart is so sinful and so evil and corrupt, mm -hmm. what comes out from our heart is filthy and sinful. It is not what goes in that defiles us. It is what comes out that's already there. That's what defiles a man. These were the very words of Jesus Christ. Why? It's because I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin, my mother conceived. You might ask, where did this come from then? You know, why do I have this sin from birth? The Bible tells us. And from history, we know that it came from the first man, Adam. Sin is like something that we inherit from our parents. And our parents from their parents and their parents. And it goes all the way back to the first man, Adam and Eve. And Romans 5 tells us that through one man, sin entered the world. And because of sin, death came as a result. Because of that, there's no ex exception. Every single person is born with sin. And again, it is better for us to acknowledge that because it is true, because then it opens the way of forgiveness and salvation. And that turning of hearts is what we call repentance. If you look at Psalm 51 again, look at some of the language here. Paul, um, David says, have mercy upon me, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Elsewhere, he also says in his prayer, please do not deal with me according to my sins. It's in 103rd Psalm, Psalm 103. Let me read this um, verse. Uh, don't need to turn to it right now. And, and David says this, God has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Because if God did, then of course we would receive the judgment of hell. But God has not dealt with us according to our sins, according to our punishment. It's like this. Um, most of us drive. 
if you have you know, license and car, you drive. And how many times have you broken the, the traffic, rule, traffic rule? Multiple times, maybe hundreds of times. But how many times have you been fined? Maybe not as many as that, hopefully. When we break the law, we may get away in this world. But before God, it doesn't work that way. It is all kept in God's record. And David realizes that and says, please do not deal with me according to my sins. Because if God dealt with our sins according to our sins, dealt with us according to our sins, then we would be under the judgment of God multiple times. It's like, what if somehow they have this system to locate and to actually fine you every time you break traffic law? That would be terrible. You probably would lose your license uh, multiple times. But that doesn't happen. Thankfully, well, you might think, well, maybe it's similar with God, and God doesn't always judge, judge us according to our sins. The Bible says that it's not because God has forgotten or God overlooked or God has no capacity to know everything, but it is because of God's patience and his long suffering. And he's actually giving you grace, grace of sort of temporal forgiveness, not judging you immediately. And at the same time, he's giving you grace and opportunity to repent from that sin and sinful nature, the sinfulness, and come for full forgiveness. And David is praying for that. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my sin before you, my transgression. I've sinned against you. What you see here is the heart of repentance. It's like the Psalm, uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, where he said, remember that the word of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Perfect means perfect, eternal, right, and it converts our soul. It begins with repentance, realizing, like David, that I have sinned in me, that I cannot change, and therefore I continue on sinning. Let me also um, have you drop down to verse 16. Um, let me read from verse 14. So David continues to pray. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Now David says, please deliver me, forgive me. But he says also in verse 16, you do not desire sacrifice or burnt offerings. What are these? If you know anything about the sacrifice and burnt offerings from the Bible, they refer to the sacrifice offerings that the Israelites would bring before God um, regularly, at least once a year as the people of God. And the reason why they were doing that was because God has told them, this is how it can be forgiven. Um, let me show you this slide. Among many of the laws in the Old Testament, there was the law of atonement or law of forgiveness. This is how you could be forgiven. So it's not so much the law like the Ten Commandments, it's the rule that God has given them, instruction God has given them, so that they might receive some sign of forgiveness. And first of all, it is the law to redeem sin or forgive sins. And that means you have to pay the penalty for sin. And the, pay, the penalty of sin is to pay uh, with death. In the time of the Old Testament, they would bring lambs or goats, and the animals would be killed instead of people. Now, the reason why that's the case is because um, uh, let me um, just explain this very briefly. In Romans chapter 6, it says that the wages of sin is death. Why? Because if you go back all the way to the Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned by eating that fruit that God forbade them to eat, you know, eating, God said, if you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. God created Adam and Eve to live forever, but 
They ate that fruit, and because of the death came into the world. This sounds somewhat theological and philosophical, but it is true. The reason why we have death is because of sin. In other words, the reason why we die is because of sin. If you remove sin, there's no reason for death. That sounds a little um, interesting. If you work in some medical hospital field, you might think, well, does that mean then there's no need for hospital? In heaven, there's no need for hospital. There's no, not only that there's no disease, but there's no sin and therefore there's no reason for death. People will not and will not have to die. The reason for death is sin. Disease, accidents, old age, these are how people die, not why. So God said, if you sin, you will truly die. And that's where sin originates. Uh, that's where death originates. Sin came into the world, and death came through sin. So the wage of sin is death. And God said, well, if you all die because of your sin, then you will all perish. And that's not good, because that wasn't God's original plan. So God said, for now, this is how you can be forgiven of your sins so that you wouldn't have to die. Not all of you, you know, will have to die. And that is by paying the death penalty by killing an animal instead of human. So they took these lambs and goats and killed these animals. And God said, I actually get to do this um, as, as a sign. It's a bit more like practice. This is redemption only by blood. Blood means death, shedding of blood, and life is given instead um, of the people, the animal's life, animal's death is given, and without shedding of this blood, there is no redemption. So this is what we call the law of atonement. And that's why the old, in the Old Testament, time, Old Testament times, Israelites would give all these sacrifices year after year and kill animals and shed blood, and take the blood to the temple of God and show to God, look, this animal was killed instead of these people, so therefore, please forgive our sins. The penalty for sin has been paid. It's like the law, the demand of the law has been appeased because death has been paid. You, know, you might say, well, that doesn't really sound um, perfect because you, know, you kill animal instead, instead of the people who have sinned. Well, it's not really fair for the animals. Well, that's why this is not the real way to forgive our sins. This was only given to them as a sign and a symbol. The Bible says in Hebrews, it says, the animals of these goats and calves cannot take away our sins. Look at verse 17 again, 16 and 17. So David says, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would have given it or I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Instead, in verse 17, the sacrifices of God what we need to give to God are what? A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Contrite meaning repentant, feeling sorry for your sin. You know, a very simple way to uh, explain. Uh, contrite, repentant, remorseful, feeling terribly sorry for your sin and your actions and wanting to be forgiven, wanting to make things right. This is a sign of turning heart converting of your soul. And these, David says, oh God, you will not despise. In other words, God's promise is that if you come with contrite heart and repentance, God will not despise and turn that down. On the other hand, we have ample examples of people in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament times, who come to God with proud, arrogant hearts. Do not repent, and they simply come to challenge God's authority. These people God destroys. They are struck down, broken in pieces, dashed to pieces, as we have read from Psalm 2. But those who come with contrite hearts, God receives these hearts, these people. And this is what we call repentance. Repentance. So yesterday, from the Psalms, we have seen the knowledge of God, that you need to know God. God is the creator. He's holy and he's righteous. He's just. He's gracious. He's merciful. We've seen all of that. Also, we know man. We have the knowledge of man that we are sinful from birth. And we face impending judgment. The moment you end your life on earth, 
is the moment you enter into the judgment of God, if you enter into eternity without Christ. And we also see from the Psalms that we need to come to God with repentance, with contrite hearts, broken spirit, mourning spirit, sorrowful spirit. And that's why, as we said yesterday, it is actually better to go to the house of funeral than to go to the house of party. If you're doing a funeral, you think about your own death, you prepare yourself with a repentant heart. And if you come with repentant hearts, contrite hearts to God, God will not despise. And this is a promise that you can trust in Him. And this is a part of God's knowledge of God that you need to have. To know God that He receives repentant hearts. And that is to know God for eternal life. To know God saving you. Well, I still the real question is this. Okay, well, I can see that you can come with repentant heart to God. And how does God forgive us? How does God accept us into heaven? That all comes down to the knowledge of Christ. Let's go back to John chapter 17 again. John chapter 17. The knowledge of Christ. Jesus said, this is eternal life that you may know, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Question then. God sent Jesus Christ to this world, but for what purpose? Why did God send Jesus Christ? That's implied knowledge you have to have when you know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It is to know not only who Christ is, but for what purpose Christ came to this world. Let's not call it the work of Christ, because he came to fulfill God's purpose, and that was Christ's work in his life. Look at verse 4. I have glorified you on the earth. So God has been glorified by Jesus Christ on the earth, because he says, I have finished the work which you have given me to. The very purpose and the mission that God has given Jesus, he has finished. Now, remind you, I remind you that this is a prayer that Jesus is praying a day before, the night before he was crucified and killed on the cross. So he has finished his earthly ministry. All that's remaining is now to be crucified on the cross and be exalted up into heaven afterwards. So he says, I have finished the work. And the question for us is, and what is that work? What is the work of Jesus Christ that he came to do, that God has given him to do? Um, let's look to John chapter 6. Let me show you this verse and then um, we'll go back to David again. John chapter 6, in the same gospel, John chapter 6 verse 40. And this is, again, Jesus saying, and this is the will of him who sent me. This is God's will, God's purpose, his plan, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, eternal life. And I'll raise him up at the last day. So even if they die in physical death, they will be resurrected to eternal life. And this is God's will. This is foundationally the will of God that he has for everyone, that he wants everyone to believe in him and have everlasting life. And that was the purpose for which God sent Jesus Christ to this world. Go backwards to verse 29. Chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. This is the work of God that you believe in him, that's Jesus, whom he, God, sent. So God's work and Jesus' work is for us to believe in him. And he had to teach people, tell people to believe in him. To believe in him is to know him, who he is, and his work, what he has done. 
Now let me give you a little bit of a twist there. Now Jesus came and died and resurrected 2,000 years ago. So I'm sure if you've been to churches, you've heard things like Jesus died for our sins, he rose again from the dead, and that's what we celebrate in, you know, during the Easter time. So you, you've heard of that. You may not believe that at first, but you've heard of that, and there are some who believe in that, who know that, that it is true. And there are people who have the knowledge um, in sort of saving relationship. In other words, that death and resurrection actually is for my salvation, our salvation, that I am saved because of that and what Jesus Christ has done. So you can come to the knowledge relatively easily because it's past event and you know that that's going to change. No one's going to go back 2,000 years ago and change the course of history. But what about people who lived before Jesus? What about, for example, David? Again, let's have a look at David's Psalms and actually see how David sort of understood all of this. Um, let's turn to Psalm 110 and actually uh, we'll, we'll go back to the Gospel accounts as well. But this was another Psalm that David wrote. David wrote Psalm 110. 110. Let me just show you verse 1 and 2. And look at this carefully. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies, your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. And the first line might confuse you. The Lord said to my Lord, who is Lord and who is the second Lord. Some translations, some Bibles that you have would write that a little differently. The first Lord, you notice, is written with all capital letters. The second Lord is capital L, but the rest are in small letters, all R-D. Can you see that? That's a sort of small distinction that English translation tries to make. The original word, actually, um, in the original Bible, the two words are different. The first Lord is the name of God, which sometimes is written Yah or Yahweh. That's the name of God. The second Lord is actually a word that means uh, Master, Adonai. So there are two different words in the original language. And that might help, because you can see that it's not referring to the same person, but two different persons. And this is David, my dear. So David says, the Lord God, the Almighty God, Yahweh, said to my master, my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So the Father God says to the Lord, sit at my right hand. And verse 2, the Father God, the Almighty God shall send the Lord of the strength out of Zion and rule in the midst of your enemies. So he will rule over these enemies. And these enemies will be footstool. What, what does it mean to have a footstool? Footstool is a little stool where you place your foot. Now, in the ancient days, when you actually have a battle and you win your victory, you literally actually did this as a symbolism. Um, you actually have your enemy, one of the captured enemies, a live enemy before you, and the general will have to put their foot upon the neck of the enemy and stamp, and stamp on that enemy's neck. That's a footstool. You might sit on a sort of throne and put your foot on the enemy's neck and use it as a footstool sign that you have won and you've got victory. And he says here, till I make your enemies your footstool, until then, sit at my right hand. So what, what is this? What does this mean? Psalm 110 is what we call the Messianic Psalm. I need to explain this to you a little bit before you can understand what it means. Now, in the Jewish uh, understanding, and um, according to Israelites' understanding of the scripture of uh, the Bible, they had this idea that they were the chosen people of God. And because they were chosen people of God, they always felt that they were special people. And yet, Throughout their history, they were always punished and they were judged and they were invaded by foreign nations and they had a lot of troubles from the neighboring enemies. 
But they always believe that they will someday become a great nation, powerful kingdom, and to do that, a king will come and give us, or give them the powerful kingdom. And that king, um, they believed to be their Messiah. Messiah is simply a Jewish word that means savior in English. In Greek, it's Christ. So when you uh, mention Christ, Messiah, or savior, it simply means someone who comes to save us. And of course, that is Jesus Christ, because we say Jesus Christ, Jesus is Messiah, and Jesus is our savior. Um, but the meaning of the word simply means to, to save, or the one who saves. So they believed in this Messiah who would come and establish the kingdom. Why? Because it's actually written in the Bible. The Bible says in prophecies that they will be a strong nation and God will destroy them. Like here, your enemies be will become your footstool. Until then, the Lord says to the Lord, to my Lord, sit on my right hand. David also believed that as well, and therefore David is praying and praying for this Messiah to come. And as every other scripture in the Bible, this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So David is writing, but he's not writing purely out of his own knowledge. He's writing with inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is actually getting him to write this, and he's saying, the Lord said to my Lord. The first Lord is the Lord God, the Almighty God. And notice the personal possessive pronoun there, my Lord. David is saying, now this Lord, this Adonai, this master is my master. He's referring to his Messiah, the nation's savior. Whoever that is, he will come and he will destroy the nations, he will destroy the enemies, and he will triumph with victory. Until then, David is saying, the Lord God will say to the Messiah to sit on the right hand of God. But when the time comes, he will come down from his throne and judge the nations. Like in Psalm 2, he will dash them with a rod of iron in pieces, and he will destroy all these enemies that are against God. And we can see that this is referring to Jesus Christ who is to come. This was written 1,000 years before Jesus came. So let's now go back to David's time and try to understand this from David's perspective. Now David understands about this concept of Messiah. David understands that the Messiah will come and establish this powerful eternal kingdom. And he's now saying in his prayer, the Lord, the Almighty God says to my master, the Messiah, that he will sit at the right hand of God until God makes the enemies his footstool. And if you keep reading verse 3, your people shall be volunteers because they are willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And that refers to the Messiah, my Lord, David's Lord. And the Lord, verse 5, again referring to the Messiah, is at your right hand, God's right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath, executing judgment. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. With dead bodies, because they're judged, he shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. This is a picture of a victory from like battlefield. This is a very much war, war language. And as David, you know, he was a warrior. He was a soldier, warrior, general, combatant. He was um, basically going around and fighting against his enemies. And he's writing in his language that when the Messiah, when my Lord comes, he will destroy all these enemy nations and have victory. But he doesn't know exactly who this would be. We know one thing from the Bible is that David might have known this as well, that this Messiah would come from his posterity, his line. In other words, he has to be born from the line of David. And this is something that we always talk about during Christmas, the son of David. He comes from the line of David. Joseph and Mary, all descendants of King David. And um, from David's line, this king, Jesus Christ has to be born. 
You might have known this, but he says, he will come and he's my Lord, he's my Messiah. Now, this was quoted in the New Testament. So let's have a look at Matthew. It's in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Matthew chapter 22. Let me read from verse 41. 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them. Now, the Pharisees were people who were against Jesus. They're very so religious, but hypocrites. They were against Jesus, and they're always engaged in this argument with Jesus Christ. And they're saying things like, you know, well, how do you say you're the Son of God, you're, you're the Christ? So they're saying, what do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? So you talk about this Christ, and you talk about this Messiah. So what do you think about this Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, and this is Jesus that asking them, and they said to him, according to their understanding, this is the son of the son of David, because he will be born from David's line. And Jesus said to them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. That's the very verse in 110 Psalm, verse 1. So Jesus' reasoning is this. Jesus says, so what do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? And they say, the son of David. So David's line and David's descendants. David's like great, 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 great grandson. That's the Messiah, the Christ. And Jesus says, if that's the case, how come David said that this king is my Lord? This Messiah is my Lord. Look at verse 45. If David then calls him Lord, my master, how is he his son? Now, why would David call his great, great, great grandchild his own Lord? In a sense that he means he is an absolute master because he's now sitting at the right hand of the Almighty God. And verse 46, he says this, Jesus says this, and no one was able to answer him a word. This is what we read. And no one is able to answer him a word nor from that day or on did anyone dare question him anymore. So what Jesus is saying is this, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ, I have come according to God's will as a son of God. And they say, no, the Messiah would come as a son of David. Oh really, Jesus says, then how come David, when he wrote this 110th Psalm, he said that his own child, to be born many, many generations later, how come he called him my Lord? The only reason why he could call the Messiah, his own Lord, was because he knew that this was going to be the Son of God. Yes, he came physically as the Son of David, from David's line, but that was only physical line, but his spiritual heritage goes all the way back to God, and he comes as the Son of God. Now, this might sound a little, you know, um, theoretical, and it's all in sort of, you know, someone's brain, but think about this. David is writing a psalm here, in 110th Psalm. He's referring to this coming Messiah as his Lord. But he's born as his child, his posterity down the track in sort of a 10 or 14th generation from him. But it says that that Messiah is my Lord, indicating that he is the Messiah to come. He may not have had the full understanding that Jesus would come first as the suffering Messiah and to die on the cross, and later as the King of Kings in the future. But somehow he knows that this Messiah is the Savior. In other words, he knows Christ. And he knows Christ as his Messiah, his Savior. And he's praying to God for forgiveness based on his knowledge of Christ. That's a very important knowledge and the truth because we can actually see that even the people in the Old Testament time before Jesus came are also saved through Jesus Christ. They may not have known him as clearly as we know now, but they knew from the scriptures that the Messiah would come, that Christ would come, and he would come as the Savior, Savior to forgive us our sins and save us from our sins. Let me show you another psalm that's quite... Um, that's quite startling if you look at it. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Now, I just want you to see this and just listen to 
um, Psalm 22 and think about or well, try to find out what this is talking about. Okay? I want you to actually see and what this is talking about. Let me read some selection of verses from Psalm 22. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Drop down to verse 7. All those who see me ridicule me. They, sh they shoot out their lip. They shake the head saying, He trusts in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. In my clothing, they cast lots. What is this about? Where else do you see this happening? Can you see that this is about the crucifixion? Well, if you don't know that, then you ought to read more Bible. You look at the old, you look at the New Testament, and look at the account of Jesus' crucifixion. That's exactly what is happening. He is nailed and pierced in his hands and in his feet. So painful was the crucifixion that he can count all his bones. Every bone and every joint is aching. They look and they stare at Jesus Christ. They even divide the garments among them. They actually tear, you know, they tore the garments that Jesus was wearing. But the inner garment was woven as one piece, and they couldn't tear it. It will destroy the garment. So they cast lots to decide who would take possession of that. And that's written in verse 18. One of the words that Jesus spoke on the cross was the very verse 1 that we have just read. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said exactly the same. Like dogs, they have surrounded him. Like bulls, they have surrounded him and encircled Jesus, and they gape and make the mockery of Jesus Christ. So can you see that even without knowing, David was given the inspiration of the Spirit, and he wrote almost as if he was recording what was happening before his eyes, what happened at the crucifixion, that the Messiah would come and die on the cross in this way. And of course pay the penalty because he said, remember that he said, God does desire these burnt offerings, of offering sacrifice of the animals. Instead, God sacrificed his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for our sins. Of course, this is not all. If you go to Psalm 16, let's look at another Psalm, Psalm 16. Yes, Jesus is killed on the cross, but it says here, verse 10, For you will not leave my soul in shell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasure forevermore. The second part of the verse 10 is quite uh, notable. It says, Nor will you allow your Holy One, Holy One, Christ, the Messiah, the King, the Lord, to come. God will not allow him to see corruption. In other words, his body, even though he died, his body will not be corrupt or corrupted. His body will not decay, which actually is a hint to the resurrection, that he would not remain dead, but he would rise from the dead. In fact, in Psalm 22, let's go back to Psalm 22, in verse 21, we have a turning point 
We can see that Jesus is crucified and he's dying, he's dead. In verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. But after he says, you have answered me. You have answered me. That's the answer to the prayer. And you'll see that after that, it is a complete reversal of what's been written until verse 21. And it goes on um, with the language of victory um, and basically um, him ruling the world in his kingdom. In verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever forever. That actually is um, indication of Jesus' resurrection and then he will be the eternal savior. And his kingdom, verse 28, the kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom is the Lord and he rules over the nations. And this will continue on forever. And after the Psalm 23 continues on to say, the Lord is my shepherd and he will lead me to the green pastures and give me eternal rest and save me from the shadow of death. So the question that I posed to you yesterday, did David know Christ? If David is saved, did he have the knowledge of Christ? He knew God, certainly. He knew what man was like. He knew about sin and the judgment. He saw that. But did he know Christ? He certainly did, didn't he? Even though Jesus hadn't come yet, he was given these words by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about Christ and his death and his resurrection, about that he is the only Savior, that he is our Master as he was his Lord, his Master. And we see that throughout the Psalms. Let me uh, show you also another Psalm, Psalm 107. Let's turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 um, has interesting images or imagery um, language there. Let me give. Uh, let me read from verse one and three first, and then. Um, just take it through the rest of the verse, rest of the, the psalm. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is mercy in yours forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west and north and south. So this is a psalm that actually sings about God's deliverance, that God has gathered his people from the enemy nations and actually, spiritually speaking, this is like God giving them eternal life and eternal rest from their, their enemies. He has assembled people as his own people in his own kingdom. And then verse 4 begins the first image. Now these people wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way and found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, soul faint in them. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. In other words, people are all lost without food, hungry and thirsty, and they are almost about to faint. And they, therefore they cried out to the Lord. Now what we see here, spiritually speaking, is people are thirsty and hungry spiritually. They see no everlasting truth in this world, and therefore they are fainting and dying because of sin. Everybody in this world who without Christ is like people like here, who are lost in the desert without food, without water, and they are about to faint and die and go to hell. But of course, when they come to repentance and realize about their sin, they cry out to God. When they cried out to the Lord, he says, God delivered them out of their distress. God gathers them as his people to his own kingdom. This is salvation. People are lost in the, in the desert. 
Another imagery is from verse 10. Now, there are peoples in the darkness. This is dungeon, prison. Those who stayed in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. And then they cried out to the Lord in the, in the trouble. He saved them, in, saved them out of their distress. The same thing. Now this is a picture of people who are in darkness. And this is everybody again. Without Christ, they are in the darkness like in prison. They are bound in affliction because they rebelled against the words of God. They rebelled against the truth in the Bible. So what God did was God brought them down with labor. You know, they, they, their hearts were brought down low with labor. God allowed sufferings and labor in this world so that they might grow for and find God. There was no one to help. The last resort was for them to cry out to God. Repentance and crying out to God. Contrition. And then God saved them out of the distress. In verse 14, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. Chains of death and sin. The third picture from verse 17. It says, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. The soul abhorred all manner of food, good food, and they drew, they drew near to the gates of death. And then they cried out to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distress. Again, you hear the people who are dying because of their iniquities, and they reject the food, the eternal food that will give them eternal life. But when they cried out to the Lord in repentance, then God saves them. Look at verse 23. This is a picture of people who are caught in the middle of the storm. Those who go down to the sea in ships who do business in great waters, they see the works of the Lord, meaning the huge waves, the nature's power, and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy winds, which lifts up the waves of the seas of the ship, where people mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. It's almost like crashing into the stormy waters. The soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunkard man, and, are like, and they are at their wit's end. They just do not know what to do. Even the most brave sailors would actually uh, you know, concur with this, and they say, if you are in the stormy, stormy sea in this sort of sea situation, you, you lose your heart. You become so terrified because you see the sheer unbridled power of nature. And of course, that behind all the power is the power of God. And they do not know what to do but to pray. So a lot of these sailors are somewhat religious. They try to find some supernatural being when they see and experience something like this. So in verse 28, they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and they are saved. He brings them out of their distress, calms the storm, so that its waves are still. What we see here is basically all these analogies and pictures of God's saving work. The common theme, the common thing that we observe here is that they always would cry out to God. God does not save anyone who does not want to be saved. God does not save anyone who does not cry out to God. He doesn't save anyone who's not repentant of his own or her sins. He only saves those who are contrite in their spirit. He saves and delivers these people out of their troubles when you cry out to God. And to cry out to God actually uh, requires you to throw away your own pride and humbly go to God, letting go of all your ego and your pride and your own self-esteem. People who trust in themselves, they don't need salvation. I gave you an example of that yesterday. I'm sure many of them, you know, there are many other people who are like that, that man who basically gave up on any religion and said, I believe in myself. If anything, I believe in my own abilities and own power. God doesn't save anyone who doesn't trust in me. God and come with repentance. Let me show you just a couple more Psalms um, that actually uh, tell us about David's uh, understanding of Christ and knowledge of Christ and therefore salvation. Psalm 103. 
We saw this before, but let me now read Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who, this is God, forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfied your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Just think about this. It says, we praise God and bless his name because he forgives all our iniquities. He heals all your diseases and redeems your life from destruction, from hell. He crowns you with his loving kindness and tender mercies. He gives all good things and we are renewed like young eagles. It is because, not because he just wants to be nice to us, it is because the penalty for sin has been paid for by his own son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6, it says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Now, on the base level, God's righteousness is to judge sin. Yep. So his righteousness and his justice is shown in his judgment to send people to hell for not believing in him, believing in themselves, not repenting of their sins. But at a sort of higher level, God's righteousness is executed when God releases those who are oppressed. His higher righteousness is when Jesus has paid the penalty and appeased God's demand and the Lord's demand of death and brings people to salvation and deliverance and giving them eternal life. That is greater righteousness of God and that is what God wills and God desires. He doesn't take pleasure in judging sinners. He doesn't take pleasure in sending people to hell. We read from the Bible. Even though that is righteous and even though that is just, that's not what God is pleased with. He is pleased with when people repent from their sins and come to God for salvation. That's the true righteousness of God. And it is righteous because Jesus paid the penalty. So there's nothing wrong, even legally speaking. Look at verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always try with us, and he says, nor will he keep his anger forever. His anger and his striving ceased at the cross. He has poured out his wrath and judgment upon the cross on Jesus Christ. And therefore, there's no more reason for him to be angry with sinners or strive with sinners. And verse 10, because of that, what Jesus has done, God has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Instead, he deals with us as he deals with his own children. He deals with us according to what Jesus has done, his work. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Verse 17, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. So you can see clearly that David knew Christ. He knew Christ savingly. One more psalm, Psalm 85, Psalm 85. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity to Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. 
Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. This is a prayer for salvation for Israel, but of course it extends to us as well. God has forgiven our sins, our iniquity. He has covered all our sins. Because of what Jesus has done, he can do that. It's not that he is letting sinners go free. The price was paid. And now he is simply transferring that price or transferring that righteousness of Jesus Christ which he paid with his death upon us, unto us. And God is now our, our God of salvation, just as he says in verse 4, your anger ceased. You're not going to be angry with us forever, are you? Will you not revive us again? We want to rejoice in you. Show us your mercy. This is a prayer. And then a statement in verse 9, surely his salvation is nearer to those who fear him, who have that holy reverence toward God. Those who come with contrition and repentance because we know that God is holy and you cannot come to God without repentance. Now look at verse 10. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Even without really understanding what it means, we, you see some beauty in that verse, don't you? Mercy and truth have met together. Mercy is, is to withhold judgment to those who, who deserve judgment. So sinners deserve the judgment of God, eternal hell, and God withholds that. In fact, God withholds that judgment to those who are saved eternally. For those who are not saved, for now, temporarily, but when they're saved, they're eternally withdrawn from the judgment, and God that's God's mercy. So that mercy of God, being kind and gracious and, and loving, and the truth, the truth demands what is right and what is true. And the truth actually says that if you sin, you have to pay with your death. And that truth has been appeased by Christ's death. So in, in fact, um, the contrasting attributes of God, the mercy of God and the truth of God have met together on the cross. It is like the cross, that vertical beam and the horizontal beam coming together at that intersection and that's where mercy and truth have come together and they met together. That is the only place at intersection where mercy and truth can come without conflicting with each other. And then secondly it says righteousness, righteousness that demands righteous judgment of God and peace peace that tells us that we have peace with God and no longer fear judgment of God. They have kissed. That's the classic poetic expression, isn't it? Righteousness and peace, they cannot kiss. They don't have lips. They are not people. But they're personified here. Righteousness and peace have come together and they have kissed one another. And kiss is that loving union. There's no inconsistency whatsoever. There is no conflict whatsoever. And in God's divine and amazing plan, both the righteousness and justice of God and the love and grace and mercy of God have come together on the cross in Jesus Christ. And that is the only reason for our salvation. And it is all written in Psalms thousand years before Jesus came by David and many of the other psalm writers. So did David and did all these Old Testament saints know Christ? Sure, they knew Christ. They knew the Messiah, the, the King, Lord, who would come. 
before uh, the lack of time, let me show you from the screen. Isaiah 53 is another, verse, another chapter in the Old Testament that talks about Jesus Christ, right? Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord, with capital letters, that refers to the Almighty God, the Father. Him is Jesus Christ. According to this verse, who laid our sins on Jesus? It's God. It's not anyone else. It's not even your prayer. It is God who laid your sins on Christ. Just praying for forgiveness without understanding all this is not going to give you forgiveness. It's not because you prayed to God that God says, okay, I'll, I'll now you know, put your sin on Christ and therefore he died for your sins. He has done it already before you asked and he has done it because... God planned it, and it is God's will that he, he would do that. And the Lord God has laid on him your sins, our sins. And of course, this is something we learn about God and Christ. And as you learn more and more from the scriptures, you know God, you understand God, and of course you can come to complete faith and trust in him. And let me tell you, God has never been proven wrong all these years. So if you want to have the history of him, so you can know him and have some sort of relationship. You've got thousands of human history and the written Bible, 3,500 years. God has never been proven wrong. He's never been proven this unfaithful. He's always been true and faithful. And he says he laid our sins on him. Of course we can trust that. We have complete faith in what he said. Just before that is some um, Isaiah 53 verse 5 he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities Jesus was wounded and bruised and pierced on the cross for our sins and the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed we are healed because of that so we talked about God's attributes now God as we have seen he is just he has justice but he's also loving for he is love you can see the two uh, opposite one another his justice demands death penalty for sinners his love demands salvation or saving those from death penalty justice is written in the law and that demands judgment of God love is grace or mercy and that actually means salvation and these two can only come together on the cross mercy and truth have come together righteousness and peace have kissed one another on the cross just one uh, more verse in the bible in hebrews chapter 9 remember that all the blood offerings of the animals just as david said in psalm 110 you know if God desires sacrifice, I would give it. But that's not what God wants. He wants a contrite heart, repentant heart. Now here he says, not with the blood of goats and calves, not with all these animal sacrifices anymore, but with his own blood, that is Christ's own blood on the cross. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He has obtained eternal redemption. Forgiveness that is valid for eternity. It is eternally effective. So in the history of time, Jesus came to this world and he came and died on the cross and said, it is finished, accomplished. What is accomplished? What is finished? He came for that purpose. Remember that? The work that God sent Jesus to this world for? To die on the cross for our salvation? And he did it by cleansing I, you know, my sins, our sins, but it has to be your sins for your salvation. So he cleansed my sins and he has finished that work. Beginning from Adam all the way, the old, all, all these people in the Old Testament times. You know, they used to kill lambs and goats and look forward to the coming Messiah like David did. David knew Christ as the coming Messiah. And he came and he completed eternal redemption on the cross. Eternal redemption means from eternity to eternity and that must cover all time in human history from the beginning to the end. That includes all these people who lived in the Old Testament times and all the people who come in the New Testament times. But for us, 
we live in our time, we look, for, we look behind, we look backwards to Christ who came. So it's actually quite easy and straightforward to, lead, to, to read from the Bible and to believe in Him. But for people who came before Jesus Christ, they looked forward to coming Messiah. And we see that clearly in Psalms, David wrote and many of the Psalmists. He obtained eternal redemption and looked backwards to Him. So all our sins are included in this eternal redemption from my birth to death, past, present, and future. There's no reference with time, it's eternity. And when God has done this through Christ, one sacrifice was enough for all time and for all people. But this man, he says, Jesus, he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down at the right hand of God. And therefore, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And this is all that Christ has done. We saw that in Psalm 22 um, and also uh, in number of Psalms, Psalm 110. In the, old, in the New Testament, um, it says that this is all the gift of God that God has given through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not because of your works, not because of anything that you've done, so you cannot boast, but it is all the work of God. So let's put it all together and try to come to some sort of conclusion here. Now we read from Psalm 107, Psalm of Deliverance by David, praise psalm, psalm that sang the deliverance of God. And this is the psalm where David said, you know, he doesn't deal with us according to our sins, our, our trespasses. But when we acknowledge our sins to you, we read this psalm before, let me just show it on the screen. When my iniquity I have not hidden, I have said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. When you come with repentance, God forgives, and that's his promise because of Christ. And this is what faith is. Faith is not simply to sort of muster your own strength and believe in something you force yourself to believe in. That's not what faith is. Faith is simply to know the scripture, the truth, and to have enough knowledge to actually trust in what God said. And that is to believe in Him. It's like, you know, when you trust someone, you, you can trust that person because you know that person. Now, again, you know, um, as I said before, you may not have 100% trust in a person because person, persons can hide things and have secrets and so on, but not so with God. God has no lies. He's always truthful, and you can trust in Him completely, and you can depend your eternal life on it. And that's why in Psalm 23, you also read things like, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. House of the Lord in heaven. Psalm 149, verse 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. All these praise psalms are praising God because of what God has done through Christ. Another one in Psalm, same Psalm 3, verse 3 and 4. Let's read this together, actually. Let them praise His name with the dance. Let them sing praises to Him with a timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will purify the humble with salvation. Verse 5 and 6, again. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud for their beds, on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Two-edged sword actually uh, symbolizes the word of God. Um, you can praise God in your bed because you're actually comfortable and resting and you have peace. Or perhaps every time you wake up in the morning in your bed, you praise God and you wake up with sing, singing or song of praise. Verse 7 and 8, let's read together. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Now this obviously means for the people who do not repent and do not come to salvation. The only thing that remains for them is the judgment of God. The last verse says this. Let's read it together. To execute on them the written judgment, this honor have all these saints. Praise the Lord. So we praise God for our salvation and for finally executing His righteous judgment. But of course, um, until that time, until such time of judgment, 
because of God's grace and his long suffering, people still have opportunity to repent and to believe. And that's why we keep preaching the gospel. And people can only be saved when they have faith in, in God and Christ that is based on the word of God. If you talk about faith without referring to the Bible, if you talk about faith without studying the scripture, that faith is only subjective feeling and emotion. Many people fall into that trap. I've, I've got to believe, I've got to believe. They try to force themselves to believe in God, but they realize they fall away again. It's because it is purely based on emotion and not the truth in the scripture. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. You have revealed us about your attributes, about your plan, about your work through Jesus Christ. And we know that they are all true. They are all worthy of our complete trust and faith. You know, even this faith that, that we have, faith with which we believe in you and your word, is your gift, the work of the Holy Spirit as we read the scriptures. We find our minds and our hearts moving towards you bit by bit. And finally turning all the way to the Lord God, repenting from our sins and from our worldly living. And we come with contrition. We come with innocent hearts, honest hearts that ask that asks you for forgiveness, that you'd cover our iniquities. And you have done just that through Jesus Christ. As Christ died on the cross, we can see that our sins were laid on him. And through the eyes of faith, we can see that our sins have been judged. And it was put to an end. And we can see through our eyes of faith that Jesus paid the penalty for all our sins, eternally having obtained eternal redemption. And now he has risen from the dead, and he still lives, and he preaches the gospel. And he has committed this preaching of the gospel to us. We thank you that we can proclaim the gospel in relative freedom. We thank you that we can actually study the word of God to our heart's content if we desire and if we will to do. We thank you that we can come together even collectively as your people and study your scriptures and proclaim this truth to many more people who still need to hear this gospel. Thank you for this amazing blessing and this privilege to be part of this ministry and pray that you will continue to work through and in us. And this all for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.